Hello everyone, Chad Franzen here, and welcome to the Kingdom Finance Show. Today we are going to reveal what you really need to know about the economy, the stock market, and real estate. And we're going to give you action steps to take right now to become a Kingdom Impact Investor. It's time to bring clarity out of chaos. Let's get started. Hello everyone, Chad Franzen. Welcome to the Kingdom Finance Show. I'm your host, Hey, today we're going to be talking about a very popular subject that's come up in the last month or so, and that is the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the free world. So today I want to share with you why I personally think that the U.S. dollar will remain the primary reserve currency in the world. Uh, Next to what's going on with banks, this is probably the most popular or most common question our team has received at Wealth Builders Investments here in the first part of 2023. So I want to dive in that today. Uh, on today's show, I've got some interesting statistics on what's happening, and um, just want to give you some perspective on that um, as it relates to how do we make sense of making money for making a difference. Again, the Kingdom Finance Show, our heart here is to empower you to gain clarity out of chaos. So when there's there's news uh, and data and information, and there's no shortage of information um, in this day and age we live in. But how do we distill down uh, what we're what we're reading, what we're hearing, what our friends are talking about as it relates to managing our finances, managing our businesses, and uh, just being good stewards with our resources that God has given us. So today we're going to focus on the U.S. dollar. Uh, there's been a lot in the news on that. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia just announced a trade alliance with China, Russia, India, Pakistan, and a few other Asian nations. And uh, their desire was to decrease reliance on the U.S. dollar. Uh, and as many of you have heard, China and Russia agreed to use the Chinese yuan currency as a settlement currency for trade. Now, um, the IMF has data that shows that Russia now has about 33% of all its reserves in the Chinese yuan. And um, Saudi Arabia uh, itself, uh, this has happened over the last several weeks, is considering accepting the Chinese yuan for oil sales. And uh, France uh, is working with China, and they are also completing some trades uh, with natural gas using the Chinese currency. Uh, China and Brazil have agreed to use the Chinese yuan in their cross-border transactions. So a lot of this has been in the news, and so we get a lot of, a lot of questions about, well, is the, is the U.S. dollar um, going to go away? Is it going to, um, not will it default, but will it, it no longer be the de facto global currency? Uh, what is going to happen to the dollar? Now, um, and understandably, this is a, a good topic for us to, to discuss, and that's why I wanted to talk about that today on the Kingdom Finance Show. Uh, from a composition standpoint, let me share some stats. Uh, the global reserves um, acro- across the entire world uh, that is in U.S. dollars in 1999, uh, that was at 72%. Now, today, at the end of 2022, uh, beginning of 2023, only 59% of global reserves are stored in U.S. dollars. So, you know, that, that is down, right? And that's where a lot of uh, questions start to come up of, well, what, what's going to happen with the dollar and uh, will it be replaced? Uh, the euro, um, since 2000, its usage is pretty close to where it was in 2000. Uh, it was 19% then. It's it's 21% now. So let's talk about China. You know, China is the world's second largest economy, and Russia is um, the largest energy supplier to China. And so they're actively trying to develop this alternative to the, to the U.S. dollar and the petrodollar as the world's primary reserve currency. Um. You know, as the reserve currency, the U.S. dollar it does give the United States uh, meaningful uh, advantages economically, financially, and politically. You know, America can 
We can sanction other countries. We saw what happened to Russia uh, with the sanctions on that. Well, l- let's talk about why, why is the U.S. dollar the strongest currency in the world? Um, so, you know, Russia cannot be a reserve currency, right? I mean, who, who, who wants rubles? Um, because, you know, based on their policies, um, you're probably going to have sanctions and, and you don't want defaults. And let's face it, no one trusts the Russian central bank. So let's talk about India. You know, India can't be a reserve currency because it, it manipulates its own currency to, to gain unfair advantages. So the Indian central bank, it just doesn't work as a, um, as a default global currency. Um, China, the elephant in the room. Uh, China wants to find a way around the dollar-denominated SWIFT banking payment system, um, which is used internationally, and that's been controlled by the U.S. Uh, so for decades, China... Europe and other countries have tried to duplicate uh, this system, but every time they've tried, it has failed. So, you know, an alternative system with China and and Europe, it it won't work without the support of the United States and the U.S. banking system. Now, recognizing that the U.S. banking system is not perfect, um, however, any alternate system you know, it's just not going to work without the U.S.'s support. You know, China, uh, they're willing to use their own currency to buy products like oil from Russia. You know, it saves them the currency exchange of uh, changing changing uh, the yuan into dollars. And, you know, they're also willing to sell their goods to anyone willing to pay them in their direct currency. So let's talk about crypto. Cryptocurrency. Well, why can't cryptocurrency become a reserve currency, whether it's Bitcoin or, or, some, or some other um, <clears throat> type of crypto? Well, you know, crypto, you know, we, we could debate that, but there's a massive volatility in crypto. Um, it's based on an algorithm. There's not a default store of value. Now, I know that's debatable, but when we're talking about becoming a global default currency, uh, crypto just doesn't have the capacity to do that. Um, again, it has its uses. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of digital currency. I like crypto. Uh, I invest in crypto myself, but it's hard to see it having, um, at least right now, I mean, it's not at a place where it can really serve with a store of value a stable store of value that can be a reserve currency for the world. So I don't see crypto uh, as a solution for that. Now let's talk about what what is a reserve currency. So a global reserve currency is not about buying and selling goods. It's about one country holding another country's bonds, their debt, that's backed by a stable, long-term store of value. And I think that's the key takeaway when we, when we talk about the U.S. dollar and is this the end of the dollar. Uh, let's face it, China, China doesn't really want to be the reserve currency because they themselves manipulate uh, their currency. They manipulate um, numbers and, and data that come out of the country. So they don't actually want to be the reserve currency. Um, you know, currency manipulation can can help you. It can work in your favor. But, you know, if you want to be a reserve currency, you have to be a stable, long-term store of value. And, you know, that's just not the Chinese government. So now, you know, China obviously uh, wants to cause pain to the United States and their economy. Um, but, I don't see them um, liberalizing or opening up their financial system to potentially become a free market to compete with the U.S.'s free market so that the yuan could become dominant over the dollar. You know, right? When you have a closed uh, system that's not a free market, 
um, system, um, then it, it can't be a de facto currency uh, for all nations on that. Um, you know, China would really have to move towards free markets, towards openness, towards financial transparency. And that, I think we could all agree, is just not on the Chinese agenda um, on that. Uh, let's talk a little about the euro. The euro is not a traditional currency, so we look at Europe. Um, the euro, really, at, at its core, is backed by a pretty loose promise from Germany and France to buy up any bonds that default by weaker countries in the um, European Union. So Greece, Italy, maybe Spain. Um, the, the euro was set up as a currency primarily to facilitate trade between the countries in the EU. It, it wasn't set up as a reserve currency. It was really more to facilitate trade in between a lot of different European countries um, that were, um, you know, selling um, goods and services on that. So um, that that's the where with the euro, I, I don't see that being a good solution as a um, default currency. And, and the U.S. dollar, it, it is the world's primary reserve currency because the global economy needs a single currency for ease and efficiency. I do think with blockchain and, and digital currency, uh, we do see that technology over the like next many, many years becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, I think of blockchain and and that technology it's similar to the internet in the mid to late 1990s. So it is in its infancy. Um, it's 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 working out uh, a lot of that um, early stage adoption usage. Uh, creating stability. A lot of the companies that started in the internet, internet like MySpace and Netscape, you know, they're not around anymore. So it does take a while for new technologies to develop. A, a lot of people also say when it comes to the dollar is, well, you know, since the Nixon administration of the early 1970s, we left the gold standard. So back leading up to the early 70s, the U.S. dollar was connected to the gold standard, and then in the, under the Nixon administration, that was um, that became no longer. And so, a lot of people will ask that as a question of, well, how can the U.S. dollar sustain itself when it's not tied to gold? So, what makes America great? What makes America great is a lot of things, but we have law-abiding citizens. Hardworking citizens who pay their taxes, go to work, believe in the First and Second Amendment, who take care of their neighbors, who want to do the right thing, who want to put their kids through college. Uh, and what backs the U.S. dollar is what makes America great. And what makes the U.S. dollar work is that U.S. citizens, voting, tax paying, working, Honest, loving citizens, 98% of all Americans, those are the American workers. 98% of all American workers will pay 15% on average of their wages to the IRS. And it's those tax dollars from, uh, from wages of American workers that support are the backing for the U.S. dollar. So instead of the gold, it is the American dream. It, it's why people want to come to the United States, <clears throat> because you can still, uh, you can find success, you can find prosperity in the United States. I mean, certainly we know we have a lot of challenges uh, politically and with our leaders and in our, in our schools, um, but th that's a little beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. The U.S. dollar is strong because we have a open market uh, capitalism system. And now certainly there's a lot of groups and, and a lot of uh, things from the enemy seeking to oppose that and overthrow that, but that is how we are set up. And so those taxes, you know, they're taken out before people get their paycheck. That's what supports the U.S. dollar. 
Now let's talk about corporations. When we talk about, well, how strong is the U.S. dollar? You know, in addition to individuals like you and I, we also have corporations. Cor- corporate tax is uh, around 21%. Um, so, you know, about 98% of all U.S. corporations, private and public, they pay uh, their share of corporate tax, which goes into the system. And that's part of what supports the stability of the U.S. dollar. So you don't see that in a lot of other countries, particularly countries that are very much um, socialist in nature and, and dictatorship in leadership. You don't see that in China or Russia uh, or some of these other countries. So, you know, the U.S. dollar is in, a, in, a, in effect a call option on the U.S. economy. So the U.S. economy... Uh, it is still what the world looks at, even with global trade and the globalization of you know, goods and services um, on that. There, there's really no other currency, in my opinion, that has this characteristic. So wh- where I land on this subject of, well, is the U.S. dollar going to go away? I, I don't think so. I, I think the points I've laid out here are why the U.S. dollar will remain the primary reserve currency in the world. I think it's no surprise uh, the developments that have happened with with Russia and with China and some of these other countries. Um, you know, they are seeking to be completely independent of the U.S. They would love to see the U.S. fail, but but the reality is when when you manipulate and you have that type of a economic structure like some of these other countries do, you're, you're not going to be able to be a reserve stable currency for for all of the free world um, on that. So I do think we'll continue to see some of these side things happening um, with with China and some of these other countries, but uh, I I don't see it um, dethroning the dollar uh, right now. We get a lot of question as it relates to this on, well, what do I do with my investments? You know, okay, so if the dollar is weak or the dollar is strong or, um, you know, Let's assume the dollar stays the reserve currency, which is my thesis. Um, then the dollar can go through periods of weakness. Uh, we've talked about inflation quite a bit. We've talked about interest rates and where they are. We've talked about some of the fragility with banks. So one of the things with when you look at the dollar, um, even if it goes through periods of weakness, I don't think it's going anywhere. I, I think there's a strong likelihood what we will see, you know, digital currencies, digital dollars by all the major uh, governments of countries around the world. Um, it, it's really in their best interest um, to do that. The technology is there. There will certainly be the opportunity for us as individuals to take U.S. dollars and put them on a ledger, to put them in a blockchain, in a in a digital uh, format, and uh, for, for whatever um, things we want to do for that, uh, whether that's for uh, buying and selling goods, um, you know, that will certainly be an option for people um, to do. So I, I don't deny that that that's a coming reality for that. There'll be a lot more use cases uh, for a, a stable digital currencies, but inevitably, you know, the U.S. Um, U.S. government and some of the major banks are already doing a pilot program on on working on a digital currency. Um, now that can be good and bad, you know, right? So a little beyond the scope of the of that of the show today, but certainly there are disadvantages for for government digital currencies because it can potentially become a, a form of spyware uh, that invades the privacy of law abiding, first and second amendment supporting, uh, tax paying, hardworking um, citizens. So let me close with this: when we think about the U.S. dollar, I, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think we need to be aware of what's going on with China and Russia in that. But I do think when you look at your investments and, and how you are managing your resources through your businesses, um, through your investment accounts, you want to be mindful of what we call hard assets and paper assets. So I don't personally think one should always have everything in U.S. dollar denominated assets. Uh, there's advantages to being diversified beyond just what I'm going to call paper assets, which would be 
Uh, good examples of those uh, for, for you would be, you know, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, index funds, 401ks. Those are paper assets. Even in your paper assets, you can diversify outside of um, U.S. dollar denominated investments. Uh, there's certainly benefits at times, depending on what other countries are doing, where a, another country's currency could be strong against the dollar, and so it can be more profitable to invest in companies internationally or in emerging markets. Uh, that That's a very viable investment strategy. There's a lot of specialized managers that that's exactly what they do. They they invest exclusively in companies in 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 India, uh, for example, uh, you know, a very growing demographic um, on that. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, economic opportunities in Africa with what's happening. A lot of people say Africa is is where China was 20 or 30 years ago. So there's a lot of not only from a kingdom impact standpoint, but there's a lot of investment dollars, um, ROI, you know, return on investments. In, in some of these emerging market countries, particularly like countries in, um, um, in Africa and, and India. So again, there, there's a, a lot of different ways when we just observe what's going on in the economy, what's going on with interest rates. In, in this case for today's show, what's going on with the U.S. dollar. I want to encourage you as a kingdom investor, we're just trying to make, uh, we're trying to, trying to gain clarity out of chaos. So the information comes in and we need to fight off greed and fear and anxiety and say, okay, this is what's happening with China, or this is what's happening with Russia. This is what's happening with inflation. So how do I, as a kingdom investor, standing and observing and understanding the the, the, the times and the seasons, how do I take that and walk out wisdom? So we want to move from knowledge. We have to have the knowledge. So this is, we're talking knowledge here, data, what's going on. How do we interpret that, right? I mean, we all know uh, a lot of mainstream sources are not going to interpret what's happening in a way that is accurate uh, or, or that is, is really fair in its, its assessment of things. So we want to take that knowledge and get understanding based on our worldview and then from our worldview as Christians, uh, we want to take that understanding and we want to shape it into wisdom. So again, I want to encourage you on, on all these topics that we share, what we're seeking to do is glean wisdom um, through the power of the Holy Spirit, um, through the use of wise advisors that we have around us. Uh, but we recognize we live in Babylon. Um, we, we have to make transactions as kingdom citizens, but we do live in a Babylonian culture. So again, you know, God has empowered us with all the resources, all the tools. We have the mind of Christ. So as we think about, well, what's going to happen to the dollar? or What about gold and digital currencies? Uh, we don't want to run out ahead of ourselves. You know, we want to walk in wisdom. And oftentimes it may be that we are given advice uh, from um, an individual or maybe we've gotten a word from the Lord on what to do with our family or our business or our investment dollars. But we always have to ask the next question, which is when? What's the timing for when we get a revelation or a measure of wisdom? Uh, we're talking about finance here. Uh, when we get a measure of wisdom or a word of wisdom, um, what if we lived in a culture as kingdom citizens where um, not only could we pray for healing and have faith for healing, but what if we could pray and have faith for financial breakthrough or to get words of knowledge or words of wisdom or prophetic insights for how to run our business, uh, how to manage our real estate, how to manage um, our assets uh, from A to Z. That's what I think is coming uh, here in the Third Great Awakening. It's going to be led by people that are in all the spheres of culture. So uh, whether it's education or political or media or finance or family or church, that, that they take what God has already given us, and we're just going to deposit that, you know, right? Because we already have it. So we're going to pull on what we already have to say, well, there's wisdom to be gleaned 
from the news of what's going on with the U.S. dollar and what's going on with uh, things in China. So, Lord, give us a revelatory breakthrough on what to do with that. So, so that is the whole mindset of a kingdom investor, right? Otherwise, this is just any other finance show, and I'm talking about topics that any other Wall Street trained person could talk about and could honestly talk about um, uh, much better than I could. Uh, they could talk about it with much more research and much more analytics. But again, what we're looking to do here is we want to take the knowledge and the understanding, and we want to ask the Lord for a word of wisdom, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge on, okay, so you know all things, so what do we do with that? Well, I hope that's helpful. Uh, again, I want to connect the financial with the spiritual because that is what will make us different as as we go out and um, we are stewards of resources uh, for God's kingdom. We want to bless those around us. We want to be light in the darkness. So again, um, thank you all for joining us on the Kingdom of Finance show today. If you want to learn more about what Wealth Builders Investments does and how we can work with you, your family, your small business to uh, take the, the the information and the topics we talk about here on the show and apply it uh, personally, how you can get wisdom, revelation in how to manage your businesses and your investments and your finances, not only for, for you, but for the generations that follow you, what we call generational wealth. Uh, please check us out online, connect with us, wealthbuilders.net. And then we have a free uh, free download available. Um, we we kind of rotate in the, the free resources we send out. You can get that by going to wealthbuilders.net forward slash invest. So again, thanks so much for joining us here on the Kingdom Finance Show today. Again, um, we look forward to um, seeing you next time. And uh, we just want to speak clarity uh, out of chaos in your, in your finances, in your businesses, and in your families. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Kingdom Finance Show. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review. It really helps to get the word out. For more resources on becoming a kingdom investor and to connect with us directly, visit our website at wealthbuilders.net. That's wealthbuilders.net. We'll see you next time on the Kingdom Finance Show.